All right, you guys, this is Ross the Fig Boss. I wanted to talk to you guys today about low tunnels uh, regarding these fig trees. I also wanted to talk to you guys today about high density plantings as we have here and really just this whole experiment, how it's been going, I guess, and um, some of the things we've been struggling with. And then also kind of what I recommend to you guys at this point. Um, so the main idea uh, with this whole planting here was to plant our fig trees very close together. They're two foot on center. And I have about, you know, this is about a 20 foot um, long planting here by six feet wide. So I have three fig trees, three rows of fig trees planted, and there's 10 in that 20 foot long section. So by 20 foot, <clears throat> 20 foot by six foot, I actually have 30 fig trees just in that small area. And it's a lot, it's a lot to deal with, um, to maintain. I've realized that uh, this is probably, I think, the best way to get the most amount of figs from a particular area. Um, even if you were to go a bit higher and have like one large tree here that would produce a lot of fruits, by doing it like this and, and having enough sunlight in that given area, you can actually get a lot more fruit, I think, this way than even if you just had a really large tree that uh, produced, let's say, even a thousand fruits. You know, I think actually um, <clears throat> this really competes with that and even uh, can surpass it in terms of production. Now, the problem, though, is that this particular system really requires a lot of light, and I don't have that light. Right now, the sun's shining over here but very briefly, um, we really don't get enough sunlight in this, this yard, especially this location. Maybe on the west side, it's a little better, but uh, what you really want in a high dense planting like this is to have sunlight all day, really from sun up to sundown. Uh, and the reason for that is you need as much light as possible to actually set these fruit buds. So one of the things we've talked a lot about this year is staking the branches away from each other, limiting the number of branches um, so that we get enough light into the canopies of these trees. As they grow, we need to have enough light to set those fruit buds. And some varieties are much better than others, uh, like Neruccio de Elba doesn't need as much light as other varieties. And I actually have, you know, six fruiting branches in here rather than the standard four that I went with this year. Another one that's really good is LSU Huye. Um, LSU Tiger is really good. Mora de Caneva is really good. Um, there's a number of them that even if we cut them back to 6 to 12 inches, which is really the, the idea every year, because these trees at this point are well over 10 feet tall, we got to cut them back. We can't keep them that, that tall in such a high dense planting. So when we cut them back, we allow only four fruiting branches per tree. And if you fill in within you know, what is that, uh, six foot wide by 20 feet deep, that's 120 square feet. In that 120 square feet, you only can have 120 fruiting branches. So you'd have potentially, if you had 120 fruiting branches, and on these particular branches, you had about an average of 15, uh, I would say you could get even more if you, you know, with some of the techniques I've learned this year in terms of pinching, um, to actually increase my production by at least 100%. I think 15 is not a bad number, but you can go even further with that um, and really get a higher production. So let's just say an average of 15, what is that, 120 times 15, you're looking at over a thousand figs there. Assuming you do this perfectly well and you really know what you're doing. That's my gripe is that, and what my recommendation to you guys going forward is just really you shouldn't be planting them this close unless you really, really, really know what you're doing and you're willing to put in that work. You know, you got to maintain this and manicure this really well and you have to have sun all day. Otherwise, what I'd recommend is very similar by cutting them back as we do, throwing the low tunnels over top, getting that head start that we desire, you can do the same exact thing, but with the Japanese cordon, with a low cord and a Japanese espalier. 
uh, by basically taking this branch here as an example and bending it all the way down to the ground and having these horizontal scaffolds that are really a foot high off the ground. And then from that scaffold, you have the spurs, right? The fruiting branches, just like a grapevine. You know, as an example, I'll show you over here, we can look at the grapes, but you keep coming back to that, that structure every year. And that's what I would say is a much better, easier method of doing this. You could see like, here is the grapevine where you've got the main stem that comes up, the horizontal branching, and then you have the branches that fruit every year. The grapes are done, but you would cut these back. And then every year you keep coming back to those spurs. And then every year it keeps fruiting. It keeps putting out new fruiting branches uh, that will then fruit that season. So you do the same thing with the figs very easily. Um, I'm gonna turn up the brightness a bit. Might be a little too bright, but it is what it is. So <clears throat> that's my personal recommendation for this, for the average grower that wants to do this at home. I mean, that was the goal, right? To get the low tunnel system, uh, to introduce that to you guys is something that everybody can do, not just me, you know, not just, um, you know, someone who's really the average grower, the average fig grower that I was hoping really will be able to do. But in this high dense system, it's just too complicated for people, I think. It's really complicated for even me. So, and you know what? Um, I don't have enough sunlight here to even make this a thing. So, um, what we're gonna do, and I know a lot of you guys, um, maybe are still a bit confused, but you know, as I was kind of getting to, let's just rewind for a second. We cut them back to six to 12 inches and then they re-sprout from the base. Or if we have a cordon, it's the same thing, right? It's, it's a foot off the ground with spurs. And then we throw the low tunnels over top and those low tunnels in the spring give the soil a really high temperature uh, that kickstarts them into growing. And we get a really good start to the season that way. Um, and they're able to fruit, I believe, in July. Now, we haven't proven that yet, unfortunately. Um, just because this year, and I want to mention this, some of the big pitfalls we had this year with the low tunnels was that we had a lot of dieback. Um, after I'd set up the low tunnels in March, uh, at some point there, I got COVID probably like a couple weeks or a week after I set the tunnels up, I had COVID and um, I wasn't really able to properly observe and, and even keep the trees um, at an appropriate temperature. You know, you have a greenhouse, even in March, things can get really hot under there. So you don't wanna blast them too much with heat. I've learned that many years now of growing my figs in containers and then having them in my greenhouse and having that space heater in there, if you give them too much heat too soon, especially before they wake up, you're gonna regret it. They are going to die. They, the tops mostly will take damage. And that's exactly what happened this year is that we did too much heat too soon and the tops really started to die back. What you wanna do is really just get them awake um, and then you can really blast that heat, but it's not, until you wake them up can you do that so you want to kind of ease into it and if you're doing the low tunnels like i am you're thinking about it you want to keep the nighttime temperatures probably above 60 if you can but you don't want the daytime temperatures really to go over 80. so you got to come out here and lift the sides up uh, keep these trees a little bit cooler um, but keep trying to warm up the soil because it's the soil temperatures that really wake them up. Uh, you can also water the, the trees a bit, maybe give them a little bit of warm water uh, if you can, which seems really unlikely, but warming up the soil is really gonna be that key, rehydrating those roots. And then when the, uh, the trees wake up, we just go nuts and we're off to the races. And hopefully by then, you know, if you can replicate what I do in my greenhouse, if you can replicate that in the ground, there's, you can definitely have fruits by July. Um, the only question I have and what I really want to observe this year and what we're going to be doing this year 
mostly actually, I'm gonna be only have really one section like one of these sections. I have about four or five different plantings. Actually, I have about seven plantings actually on the property of figs, uh, different areas of the yard. But one of the seven areas uh, will be uh, for these low tunnels. I'll set up the tunnels. I will compare that area. Uh, and I'll do this in the future too. I'm not going to give up on this, but when I move out of this property and have more sun, like I have, you know, too many problems with trying to do this here. You know, like I said, you need the sunlight to set the fruit buds. Um, I don't have enough sun. I mean, this area here at this point of the year only gets like five hours of light. Maybe, I mean, it barely gets any light. It's in between two shade trees right now, but for the entire day, it doesn't get anything until maybe the afternoon. And that's by that point, the sun goes down at six. You maybe get four hours of light. Um, so we have problems here is what I'm trying to mention. What I'm trying to really say is that we can't really do this, I think, feasibly, easily, I should say, um, until I move to my new property. However, I'm not gonna give up on it because I still think it is possible here in this location. So we're gonna continue to do that. But what my new thoughts are, what I, I really wanna see happen because we had um, our little ruby tree if you guys remember this, we did a video on earlier in the season where this little ruby tree fruited very early and this tree got through the winter time without any damage. I didn't cover it. I did not protect it, but we had such a mild winter that the tree put out a ton of fruit and it fruited uh, in early August, which was uh, pretty much, I think, before any of my other main crop trees on the property actually if i'm not mistaken um before even any of the potted trees um that did not receive a head start so this thing fruited in very early august from an in-ground tree i mean that's really impressive i think the location is perfect this is a really good <clears throat> um you know specimen for really what's possible because this is the perfect spot in my yard. It's on the southwest corner. It gets a ton of heat and a ton of sun, and it's planted in kind of a raised bed, which is slightly above grade. And this root temperature, the root system here, really warms up quick. And this tree just got off to a ridiculous start with no damage, no re-sprouting from the base. And for me, I think it'll be very interesting to compare you know, whatever the trees are that I do the low tunnels on, I cut them back to six to 12 inches. And then I um, compare it to these, to a tree like this. So we're gonna wrap a lot of trees this year. And I haven't really shown that to you guys, but along the, the house actually on this side, we're gonna wrap almost all of these. And then the rest of them, what I'm gonna do for the majority of them actually is not wrap them but we're gonna limb bend. And uh, a grower in, um, <clears throat> what's his name? His name is Brent, but where is he? Uh, I think he's in Delaware. So not too far away from me. Um, he's a commercial grower there and uh, he does that method where he bends his limbs to get them through the winter time. So he'll take basically a number of these branches, bend them down to a really low point in the ground um, and then tie them to something. You could put a wire system in. He ties this to a wire um, and then the wire keeps everything low. And then he covers that uh, section there with tarps and things like that. Kind of how I do the cut and cover method. It's very similar, except that you can just bend these guys all the way down to the ground. I did it, la I did it this uh, prior winter actually with uh, the Daloso tree is I bent one of the branches down and staked it so that it stayed low and covered it just like I did the rest of the trees with the, uh, the straw, you know, the leaves, and then covered that with the tarps. So we're gonna do that again this year, is that we're gonna cover them the same way basically, except I'm gonna be bending these limbs and not cutting all of them back to six to 12 inches. I'm gonna limit probably <clears throat> because some of these trees like Neruchilla de Elba has six fruiting branches. I'll probably limit this maybe to one or two. 
but the majority of these trees will be limited to one trunk. One trunk, and I think that may even be overkill. <laughs> I don't know how you go lower than one. You'd have to go to zero if you did that, but uh, I think that's the only way I can make this work. Um, at least with this very high dense system here. And this is, I think, gonna give me the best results. <clears throat> so we're gonna compare uh, limb bending, seeing the results of really, cause limb bending guys, is just the same thing as wrapping your fig tree. There's no real difference. You're getting your branches through the, through the winter with no damage or very minimal damage. You unwrap them and then they spring right back up in the, in the air and it's like uh, nothing ever happened. And it should be just like that little ruby tree. I mean, the little ruby is a extremely early variety. So someone's gonna be like, Ross, you know, I told you or whatever it is they're gonna say, uh, you know, but that little ruby, although it fruited in early August is really among the super earliest varieties. So, you know, it'll be interesting, I think, to really at some point in the future, compare something like a Ron de Bordeaux as an example Growing that under a low tunnel um, versus wrapping it versus limb bending, as an example. Now, when you limb bend, here's the problem, is that these trees are so large that you can't put a tunnel over top of them. So there is no added benefit of all that excess heat from the tunnels, from a greenhouse. Um, so, It'll be interesting, I think, to compare the two to see which one ends up actually producing more fruit and earlier fruits. Um, so that's my goal, is to uh, come up with uh, you know, an experiment, really, at that point, uh, comparing the two. Um, and then, of course, um, what was I getting at here? Like I said, these, by doing it like this, we're not gonna give them any sort of head start, but, but really what is, I think, even better than the rest of them, I mean, you want a really great recommendation, is just put a high tunnel over them, you know? Uh, grow your figs underneath a high tunnel. <laughs> I mean, that's the best of all of this, and, and we're really just, um, in a sense, uh, we're trying to game and trying to improve, do the best we can, in our current situation. You know, not everyone has access to a high tunnel. A high tunnel by far and away is the best option. Um, and I would think the next option would be a low tunnel. Um, but it seems like to me, there's something special going on when you don't cut them back to six to 12 inches. Uh, it seems like the trees um, behave a bit differently. They fruit a little bit earlier. so you would think the tunnels are creating a system where you have all that excess heat and they're going to be able to fruit at a much earlier date. Uh, but these trees, by not cutting them back and leaving them unpruned, I mean, really just unpruned completely. So I'm not even going to take off the tips probably on some of these branches. I mean, what I came in here and did uh, was that we have, we did some pinching earlier in the season and then all these new fruiting branches had formed, I'm going to even leave these alone. You know, I'm going to probably limit this. So this is, if I left this fruiting branch and bent this down this winter, I have one, two, three, four, five, five fruiting branches for this uh, Neruccio de Elba. What I'll probably do is cut out this one here right in the middle. So you can see this here, which is in between the others. By cutting that out, that just will give them a little bit more light to set the fruits. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I have to do, right? Is I have to come in here and give them the right amount of light. But if you don't prune it, there's something that's going on that they just fruit earlier. They just, they just do. So I think the, the amount of pruning that I do and cutting them way back is good in some senses and bad in other senses. So cutting them back, let's say maybe I lose some earliness to the, to the figs, but then that's kind of made up. It's, um, 
there is the benefit of the greenhouse, benefit of the low tunnels. So it depends. It really Matt, It really is going to be interesting to see if that trade-off makes sense. Because if you cut them back and you're losing some earliness, let's say you lose two weeks, but then your low tunnels give you a month, then that's going to be a positive, right? You're gaining two weeks. But if I can cut, if I not, if I don't prune them and just limb bend them and don't give them any greenhouse head start, then um, I should be seeing a lot of this, a lot of these figs ripening in early August to mid August. So the question is, will my low tunnels give me enough of a head start to ripen in July to really make it worth it? You know, I think that's really the question. And obviously it depends on where you live. Maybe in Maine or something, a low tunnel situation is much, benef much more beneficial than uh, it would be here. So yeah, very interesting. Those are my thoughts. Um, that's why we didn't have a great start this year with the tunnels and I still don't know the potential of this. It was too hot too soon. We had so much dieback that then killed a lot of these branches. And then they had to re-sprout from the base again. And uh, it really set them back where uh, about a month, I would argue. So all that dieback really kills these trees. If you do it too hot too soon, you're gonna regret it. I should have known. But uh, yeah, guys, that's this video. I hope you, you learned something, you got something out of this, you're doing something like this, because we can do better than um, growing these figs in containers, I think. Uh, this is really the bottom of the totem pole for me in terms of uh, you know growing figs in a colder place at this point. Even just putting your tree in the ground and wrapping it, I think is a better way to grow them than in these containers. But you know, I'm growing them in these pots for trialing purposes. It's really all it is to trial all these different varieties. So we'll see you guys soon. All right. Thanks for watching. Uh, we'll catch you for the next one. All right. Hit that subscribe button. Check out our blog. Take care, guys.